my name is Eric Madison. I am the director, actually, of the Research Information Center and also the chair of the Division of Hematology here. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this Meet the Researcher session, a periodic program that we do so that people can learn a little bit about specific research that's going on here at Mayo Clinic. We have over 5,000 different research projects going on at any given time that involve humans, and a lot of the emphasis today in medicine is the regeneration of organs and organ structures. And Dr. David Lott, who is at the Department of ENT, ears, nose, and throat at the Mayo Campus in Scottsdale, Arizona, is an expert in this area. And he's here in Rochester this week and kindly has, uh, agreed to give us a little bit of background about what's going on in his field in regenerative medicine and to um, take some questions from you. Um, we can also take questions later on about other forms of research that are going on here at Mayo and other uh, and ways that uh, I, you, you can be involved if you're interested in that or learn about uh, the very uh, broad palette of things that we have going on here. Um, a lot of that is displayed in this room. It, it is um, all the way from the science of healthcare delivery to individualized medicine, personalized medicine, regenerative medicine, uh, clinical trials in every conceivable field. And we do lots of epidemiology, trying to understand how diseases occur in populations. So uh, it's a really exciting place to be. It's a great time to be alive and a great time to be in medicine. <laughs> Anytime's a good time to be alive. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Lodd, thanks very much for coming. Uh, well, thank you all for, um, for inviting me. I appreciate it. And thank you for coming to listen. And a lot of this is informal as we can make it. It's just more of an introduction to what regenerative medicine is, first of all, to begin with and how that applies to what I do. So my, my training is in ENT, uh, which is ear, nose, and throat, but I specialize, I did a fellowship just in surgery of the voice box. So I only do surgeries on cancers of the voice box, airway reconstruction, voice, and swallowing problems. And my background is I did my training a bunch of different places, and my, I've done research on larynx transplantation and regenerative medicine kind of through my training. And then when I came to Mayo about four years ago, uh, the Center of Regenerative Medicine was newly forming and fit in perfectly with where my interests were and, and what is a huge need in our patients. And, you know, the, the good and bad thing, I guess, about a lot of our patients is that their problems tend to be overlooked quite a bit because we can take our voices for granted, our ability to swallow for granted, ability to breathe for granted. Um, and it's not until that is lost that all of a sudden it becomes a really big deal really quickly. And so I'll show you a few of these things here. Um, and what I'm really, really excited about, if I can get this to work. Maybe not. I click there. Here, I'll do it that way. You go. Perfect. So, uh, what we have started in um, is a head and neck transplantation program. And that involves everything from your ears, nose, uh, teeth, jawbone, voice box, and trachea. And what we're starting with now is, uh, at least in my area, is the voice box and trachea. And that is a wide variety of different ways we can do that. And our program is based a lot on Mayo's three shields, which I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with, which is clinical uh, patient care research and education. And that's how we've designed the same program. So we have the, the research itself, but also having an avenue to translate that clinically to our patients. Uh, the academic component, getting the word out, supporting the science, making sure other scientists who are uh, studying the same thing. It's not a competitive process. We want to further that science. And then also training the next generation of people who can then stand on our shoulders and take, take it out to a, a whole new level. So the, the program has two main components. It's the clinical transplantation pr program. And that's what this is all about. It doesn't, in my mind, from a, as a surgeon, make a lot of sense to do research that just ends up in papers. It has to end somewhere. It has to end with helping patients out. And so we have to have an avenue started where we can translate our clinical or our research studies to, to patients easily and safely. And the transplantation program is both through traditional transplantation means, meaning taking an organ from one person and transplanting it to somebody else with immunosuppression, 
but also tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, um, which is creating new organs or new tissues for those patients and implanting those. And then secondarily comes the, the science, the basic science research that helps to support that and really advance the, those components to it. So um, transplantation, the big question is, is why do it? And this is one of the big um, questions around what's called non-vital organ transplant. It's not like a heart or a kidney or a lung, whereas if you don't have that, then you can't live without your heart. The larynx you can live without, a trachea you can live without, we can do other things to make it so you live. But it's a, it's a huge quality of life issue. And like I had mentioned before, it's one of those things that we take for granted. So if you think about what your voice box does or your, the, your airway does, it allows you to smell, taste, swallow, breathe, and communicate in a human voice with people, right? So in a voice once your own. So restoring these functions through transplantation or regenerative medicine allows people to get these things back. So, I have lots of patients that we have that this is, and most of these form around our cancer patients. So a lot of our cancer patients will have to have a laryngectomy where we take the entire voice box out and you bring the trachea up to the skin so they actually breathe through a hole in their neck. And these are what I have to, to tell them to expect from the surgery afterwards. And then also some of the, th the things on the list are what they have told me they've suffered through after the surgery. So. Uh, first thing is they're going to be a permanent neck breather. They never breathe through their mouth or, or nose again. Uh, you can't ever get in the water because you can't protect your airway. So if you're in a pool or you're in a boat and you fall over, there's no way to protect your airway and you're going to drown very, very quickly because you can't hold your breath. You can't protect anything. Um, it's just a hole in your neck. So bugs can fly in there. Bugs can crawl in there at night when you sleep. I've had patients tell me that that happens. Uh, because you can't breathe in through your nose, you can't sniff. So if you get a cold and you have a runny nose, it's constantly running down your nose. Same thing with smelling and tasting. Oh, this is touchy. Um, as you can't s smell anything, which then affects your taste. And this ends up really leaving a lot of social isolation. You don't want to go out and be seen in public with all of these things that go on. So people tend to become very reclusive with that. Same thing if you have a swallowing disorder, is a lot of times you... Um, oh, we're going... There you go. Uh, you have to either have a permanent feeding tube or you choke and cough every time you swallow. Um, you can't go out and eat with other people. Um, it becomes a very embarrassing situation, again, leading to isolation. And lastly, the same thing with speaking. And this is the thing of all the things that I mentioned that most people are most upset about when they have a, a laryngeal problem is their inability to communicate. So if you think about what defines us as individuals, it's our ability to do what I'm doing, to speak, to you know, laugh, tell jokes, to communicate with people, pick up a phone. And that's how you define your identity, especially in someone you know, like a singer or who has spoken their entire life as a preacher or a teacher. Uh, so when you lose that, you really lose your identity. And so they're forced to either have no voice or, or a robotic voice, can't speak on the phone, and again, you lose your identity. Uh, the other part of it is I would argue that reconstruction of the voice box and transplantation of the voice box really is a vital organ because I have lots of patients. I go through that list with them and say, well, this is how it's going to be for the rest of your life. And they'll say, I don't want to live like that. I don't want, that's not the quality of life that I want to have. And so they'll choose to die, let the succumb to their cancer as opposed to living like this for the rest of their life. And so for those people, this is a life-saving um, transplantation or life-saving reconstruction. Uh, it's in the same vein, a lot of the cancers that we deem unresectable, meaning we take a look at the CT scan and we see uh, where the cancer revolves and we say, well, sorry, we can't do surgery on that. There's nothing we can do for you. It's not necessarily because the cancer dictates that. It's be we can take the cancer out for pretty much everybody, but we don't have a way to reconstruct them. So to, to take a cancer out and leave a large defect, and nobody can live after that. So if we don't have a way to reconstruct that, that's also going to be life-saving for these people too, for the unresectable patients. Um, it will also help us prevent doing laryngectomies in general because most of the cancers, can get that to work, there we go. Most of the cancers uh, that we do laryngectomies for, it's not because, again, the cancer dictates it. It's because they won't have a functional voice box afterwards if we take out the cancer. So we have to take the entire voice box out. They actually have better function than leaving a non-functional part of their voice box in. Um, there's a huge patient desire for it. If we, we've surveyed 
uh, our patients that have had laryngectomies. And over 75% of them said, yes, if you had the ability to transplant or reconstruct my voice box, I would sign up for it in a minute. And after the first transplantation was done, uh, the, re the reviewer for the New England Journal of Medicine uh, who happened to be a thoracic surgeon, Aaron, a laryngectomy patient. I don't know how you find that person as a reviewer, but it's the perfect reviewer for this. I mean, that's a pretty specific thing. The New England Journal is pretty impressive. Um, but he, in his critique of, the, of their article, he wrote that if I was 40 years old, I would consider having the surgery done myself. And so that it, I, my opinion, it is a life-saving procedure. It will increase quality of life dramatically, and the patient desire is there. So. Um, this is Dr. Strom. He uh, was my mentor when I was at the Cleveland Clinic a while ago. Um, and he did the very first laryngeal transplantation back in 1998. And the patient's done very well. It was actually just ex explanted um, about a year ago, so after 15 years. And that's a, that's a good survival for any transplantation. Uh, since then, there have been a few done in Europe, which haven't been documented very well. Um, and then one other one done in the States at UC Davis, and that patient is also doing very well. It was back, done back in 2010, so five years ago already. Um, right now, there is no design center, so we've had a few kind of spotted places where people are getting these reconstructions or transplantations, but no place where you can hang your hat and say, okay, I have this problem, and I want to go to a place where this is done routinely and safely, and it's not just a one, one and done thing. And so that's what we're doing at the Mayo Clinic, is we're designing a center that allows us to have these transplantations done as a true reconstructive center. So that would involve, like I mentioned earlier, both traditional transplantation and then also allowing for some of these regenerative medicine techniques. Um, so where are we now? We're still in the early phases of it. Um, where we're getting the uh, approval, but we're hoping by uh, early 2016 that it will be up and running and, and able to do us our first uh, our first surgeries at that point. Where are you having to go to to get the approval? It's a good, good question. So, for the approval process, there's an approval through Mayo, obviously to get that up and running and get the structural support in place. Uh, we have to get a because we use a lot of stem cells, we have to design it as a clinical study. So we have to get our IRB, which is our institutional review board, on set as doing it from a clinical study. And then lastly, we have to get approval through the FDA um, because uh, there, there have been a few that are they're considered investigational for the transplantation part. And then from the regenerative medicine part, it's early enough on that they're, it's, they're considered investigational new devices or new drugs. And as part of that, it has to be a clinical study also. So, those are the three areas that we're, we're focusing on right now. Uh, so here's some of the challenges when we, when we try to do this, and this is what we're tackling in the, in the lab, is that, well, first of all, most of our patients are cancer patients, and so you can't give them immunosuppression. It's if you give someone immunosuppressants when they're on cancer, their cancer is going to become wildly metastatic very quickly. And that's happened each and every time we've done that experimentally for people. Uh, the voice box is very, um, has very distinct and uh, delicate jobs, in voice, swallowing, breathing, and very small changes, just even, even in the vocal fold itself, can have a dramatic effect on the function of the voice box. So we have to be very accurate. Uh, there's very little research that's been done to, to date, and there are multiple tissue types within the voice box itself. So if you just take a look at this, here's the front view of the, of the larynx. Oh, I don't know why that, oh, because I touched it. Oh, don't touch it. No, that's right. And you have um, a bone here, so this is a hyoid bone. This is the cartilage of the thyro thyroid cartilage of the voice box. You have a cricoid cartilage, epiglottis, epiglottal cartilage. You have six different types of cartilage within the voice box itself, and they all have different characteristics to them. You have respiratory epithelium above and below the vocal folds. And then you have the vocal folds there themselves, which look like this. So you have an outer layer, which is an epithelium that's one, about three cell layers thick, so it's very, very thin, kind of like saran wrap covering the voice box. Then you have this jelly layer in between, and that's kind of like jelly, but it has three different distinct layers to itself. It's superficial, a middle, and a deep layer to it that all have very um, specific characteristics within that. And then you have a muscle layer here um, that helps support and move the vocal fold. And then lastly, the other part that is a challenge is that the voice box is a true bio, 
uh, mechanical structure, meaning it's living tissue, but is a machine also. So you have to be able to uh, get the, not only get the cells to grow, but have them function properly. And here's an example of that. So we have muscles that open and close the vocal folds, open when you breathe, and then when you swallow or you phonate, you speak, your vocal cords come together. And then you have muscles that help to pitch vary, to vary your pitch, higher pitches, lower pitches, and that changes the, the, the vocal fold activity. So here's what this looks like. This is the vocal fold itself. Here's the right side, left side, it's backwards, so their face is down here at the bottom. And you can see with this person saying E, and so it's kind of at their standard pitch. If the vocal folds were closed, the air comes by them and makes them vibrate. And then she'll go to a lower pitch, and you'll see the vocal folds will get shorter and fatter, so kind of like a guitar string. If you loosen the guitar string, it's going to become a little looser, a little shorter, and you're going to have a lower pitch. And then she'll go to a high pitch, and you'll see how much it stretches. So in order to get a truly functional larynx, you have to have all those tissues, uh, the proper types, but you have to get that function, functional part to it, and there are ways that we're trying to, to work on that. Uh, the, uh, you know, I'm a surgeon, I have a background in, in transportation and regenerative medicine, but I'm not an expert in it. There's a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me, and in order to get this up and running, you have to surround yourself with those people that are smarter than yourself, and so I have a great team of people that work with me. Uh, uh, people that, work, that are experts in stem cells, uh, have a biomedical engineer, um, cell biologist that works with me, um, a couple of people that help determine the functional aspects of it in terms of modeling the vocal folds so that if we make a change in the structure here, what's that going to do downstream so we can model that on a computer. I uh, work with a physicist who's an expert in the nerve, uh, electro electrical conduction of the voice box, and then also with transplant sites. Okay, who is it? His name is Jorgen Neubauer. He's at Arizona State University. Have you ever worked with Ingo Tietze? I have, actually, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, very much so, yeah. Is he involved in any of this? Um, a little bit. Not very much with this component of it, yeah, but he, with a lot of the, the functional things he works on. Yeah, he's a, he's a brilliant man. That's so. a good quote right there. Yes, exactly right. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Yes, that's a good, <laughs> wise, wise quote to live by, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly, very important. And same thing with our students. We have, through Arizona State University, uh, lots of students who are working on different projects through the biomedical engineering department down there. So that's um, recreating new uh, um, testing materials and bioreactors, lots of the different things that we need to do. So I'll, I'll show you examples of those here. Um, so we've broken up our research into trying to change immunosuppression or vary the immunosuppression regimens to make transportation a, more, a better option for more people. Understanding pathology, developing the instrumentation because this is very new, so the instruments aren't even developed, so we have to create those ourselves. Uh, work on that neuromuscular regeneration, work on the structure of the vocal folds, and then also put everything together into either a total larynx or to begin with just a part or half of the larynx is, is where we're starting. And so here's this transplantation research here. So um, one way to get around the problems with immunosuppression is to, uh, the, the complications that come from immunosuppression medication relies on the cumulative dose of medications over time. So right now people that, are on trans, that have transplants take medications daily for the rest of their lives. Well, we asked, why do you have to do that? Can you just pulse at different parts um, or at different times throughout the transplantation and see if you get the same effect? And so from a larynx transplant model, we were able to get 10 months for our study, which was long-term survival, with a total of only 15 days of immunosuppression, just by pulsing it at strategic times throughout the course of that transplantation. So that takes 10 months of daily immunosuppressives down to only 15 days, so half of a month. Um, the other part of it is can we trick the immune system to recognize the transplanted organ as its own body? And the main cell that's responsible for that is called the dendritic cell. And that goes around and it samples the body constantly. And what it does is it presents that protein to your, to your body. And if it's an abnormal cell, it becomes activated or matures. If it's a normal cell, it just stays in the same shape and that communication with your body tells your body to go destroy that. So it's the main um, cause of rejection. And what we found a way that we can prevent that maturation process. 
so that if you inject those cells that are uh, blocked from maturing, at the same time you do the transplant, they'll go around and they'll sample the transplant and not mature, so they'll present it to the body as its own self. And your body will then learn to, to recognize that transplant as its own self, and, um, which is indeed what we found that you know, with a one-time injection at two months, the study was only two months, you had normal, uh, no, uh, no evidence of rejection in the graft itself. Question. Absolutely. So you're talking about immunosuppression for transplant. Correct. But do you need immunosuppression for something you generate? Not at all. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's so yeah. you're doing you're doing what's being done right now and hopefully when you generate it right out of the body with the cells, then that's all gone. Correct, exactly. And that's that's the segue. So yeah. you know, right now we don't have the capability of replacing the entire larynx for somebody. And so for those patients, we're still having to do a traditional transplantation. So if we're having to do that at this point, we have to try to optimize the immunosuppression. What our goal is, and where we're gonna be very quickly, is for those people that don't need an entire larynx, you can patch graft or prevent the laryngectomy from happening. And that's all with regenerative tissue. And that's actually what the rest of these, these slides are on. So it's a perfect segue. Um, so the rest of this is all the regenerative medicine. And so what that is, is I like to think about regenerative medicine as looking for the fountain of youth, essentially. So we're trying to take our bodies, which are maintaining and repairing processes that are damaged in our body, and actually trying to get them to recreate or regenerate new cells. And so this is, this is my youngest, I have four. This is the youngest of, of four. And so this is a great example of, of what this process is going on. So this is when she was born, and this is what she looks like today. And in this process, she is, like I had mentioned earlier, she's taking very early on organ systems and tissues and generating those to become mature tissues, but the exact same type. She's not forming scar like we would, or else she'd be all scar at this point. You know, she's forming normal, healthy tissue. So what happens as we, as we age is we transition from this generation of new tissue towards maintenance and healing. And what we're trying to do with tissue regeneration is we're trying to induce a state of regeneration. So we're trying to get back from maintenance back to, to generating these new tissues. It could be done once, and we still have those capabilities hidden in the body because some organs, like your liver, will regenerate completely normal liver. If you take out part of your liver, it'll actually regenerate kind of like a lizard's tail. It's not just scar tissue. So those capabilities are there, we just don't know how to tap into them. So, um, and there's two ways of looking at tissue engineering or regenerative medicine. One is through injecting, or, uh, injecting cells or substances that help to direct the body's normal processes. So if I do a surgery on someone's vocal fold and I know they're going to get scar there, can I inject something at the time of that surgery that's going to, instead of cause scar, cause generation of normal tissue? So that's directing the body's own processes. And the other one is what I've been talking about is actually recreating new tissues and new organs to implant in. And that these, you're, everybody's studying this essentially, so in all areas of the body. And there are three main components to all tissue engineering from either one of those. The first is the scaffold, which is the 3D structure that gives the shape and the integrity to, to the tissue that you're forming. You have the cells themselves that are going to turn into whatever tissue type you're trying to grow. And then you have the regulatory factors that help those cells differentiate, differentiate correctly into the right types of cells. So what we're looking at, we're breaking down from a regeneration standpoint, is the first thing is in, under to, in order to truly understand the correct normal processes, you have to understand what's going wrong in a tissue. And so here this is a, a very interesting uh, disease. It only happens in women for whatever reason. The area right below your vocal folds where your voice box transitions to your trachea, in a subgroup of women, that area scars severely for no reason at all. They get really tight, thick scars. And they have to have surgery after surgery or a big trachea reconstruction. And we have no idea why that's, uh, why that's happening. So we got a grant to take a look at that tissue and do DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, look at the, the, protein, the secretions and all the different proteins that are happening in that area to figure out why this is occurring. And so through that research, not only can we help those patients, but it helps us to understand why tissues are scarring the way they are. And then we can take that information and apply that to our regenerated tracheas 
to know, okay, well, these pathways are causing scarring. We can come across and, and work with a different pathway. And we're doing the same type of thing with vocal folds, with vocal fold scarring to understand how vocal folds are created. Uh, instrumentation, I'll just throw these up here real quick. Um, the main parts of it, so we can, we can have a great scaffold, we can have all the cells we want and all the bioactive factors, but the way tissues truly form is through their environment. So you get the right cell type in the right environment, and that's what actually causes them to turn into a trachea or a vocal fold or those different types of things. So when you're trying to grow these tissues, you have to grow them in an environment that replicates what, where they're going to be. So for a trachea, for example, those cells are exposed to air. Um, and they have air on one side of them and blood and nutrients on the other side. And so we have a bioreactor that's essentially like a rotisserie for a barbecue that helps to rotate the trachea. And half of the time it's in the air, so the cells are getting exposed to the air, and the other half are dipping it down through the nutrients so it can replenish the, the needs of, of those individual cells. We have high-speed cameras that can actually look at the vocal folds vibrating, the different tissues themselves, so when we test them functionally, are they replicating? Uh, the normal environments and you know a bunch of distal functional uh, tools that we need to, to recreate. Uh, from a neuromuscular regeneration standpoint, um, it's one thing to the way nerves are, are formed is you have a nerve that looks like a cable, but within that nerve you have hundreds to thousands of individual little nerve fibers, and they're all directed towards one processes. So when you cut a nerve, you can't just put them back together because especially to say for the voice box, one nerve is saying to close the vocal fold, one part of the nerve is saying to close the vocal fold, one part of the same nerve is saying to open them. So if you just put them back together, you have no way of guaranteeing you're getting the right nerve to the correct muscle. And so you get a static movement where the vocal fold doesn't move. And so we're trying to figure out ways to, to identify specifically where each individual nerve fiber is. And we've developed an electrode that wraps around the outside of a, a nerve and has little feelers in them. And that can sense the, the sensory input. So we can have that, a lot of these surgeries are done with patients awake, believe it or not. So we can have the patient um, breathe. We have the, the monitor around the, the distal end of the nerve, oh sorry, the, the end of the nerve that's cut that's attached to their brain still. And we have them take a deep breath in and we see which nerves fire. And, and we have them say E and we see which nerves fire. And we can mark those and localize those. And then we do the same thing on the other side, but instead of sensing them, we actually give individual parts of the nerve a signal. And so we signal this part of the nerve when we see the vocal fold move, we know to match that end up. And so you can localize specifically where each geographic area of the nerve is and try to put them together that way. Or a much easier way just to bypass that is to use a, a pacer. And you can use a pacemaker that senses when the muscles that, your intercostal muscles, which are between your ribs, when they move so you breathe, your vocal fold, well, that pacer will fire uh, uh, a stimulus to open up their, your vocal fold at the same time. And then it goes back to a resting state at rest. And then take a deep breath and they open, you go back to talk and they close. And so you can, you can train the pacers to do that for you. And this is a, what it looks like um, in a high-speed camera. So here are the vocal folds. It's kind of the same picture I showed you before. Uh oh, there you go. Um, but you can see how soft and pliable that is. And without reconstructing that, you're not going to get a good voice or functional outcome from there. So we're looking at lots of different ways of trying to establish that. But the, the primary way of trying to reestablish that is through injecting a substance called hyaluronic acid, which is what that gel layer is made of. And you can put individual cells in that. You can put the different bioactive factors in that. And you can inject that either at the time of surgery but a lot of what I do is office-based procedures, and so I can inject these things in the vocal folds with people awake, and they're sitting there watching it on the, on the TV screen behind my head, and they can see everything that's going on, and we can actually repair the scar in real time just through a simple injection that goes into the vocal fold. Um, the other side of that is if for our cancer patients, we'll remove the entire vocal fold. We won't have a scaffold that we can put back there and replace the, the area that's missing. And then the last component, is the putting it all together and making an entire, or at least a half of a voice box. So that would include the epithelium, would include a, a primitive vocal fold on that side, um, and the structural components behind it. Or you can do different patches to help repair holes that were there before, but really what we need to do to prevent these laryngectomies is to get at least a hemi larynx. And so the concept behind that, a hemi meaning a half of a larynx. 
The concept of let me, let me go past this here real quick. Um, keep that in mind. Let me just show you this, this here, one other thing. So there's two different ways of doing this. As one is through 3D printing. We can 3D print that scaffold or that structure. Or we can take that structure from a donor, from a person, take all the cells off of it so there's no antigenic potential, there's no way that can be uh, rejected because it's just a, an inert material. And we can put the patient's own cells on either one of those scaffolds. So I can, we can harvest your fat, take the stem cells from that, and regenerate those scaffolds. And it can be done either through 3D printing or through decellarization. So that's what this look is here. Is, so is, is embryonic stem cell required, is that all over with now? These yeah. are all coming from the patient themselves. All coming from the patient. Yeah, really no one ever uses uh, embryonic stem cells anymore. Yeah. And, and the, the two main lines that people use are either from fat or something called an, an, an induced pluripotent stem cell where you can take cells from the dermis and the skin and you can take what were somewhat mature cells and cause them to become stem cells and then bring them back to whatever line you want to be. So it's kind of an extra step with that. And so what we do, and I'll walk you through this, for the decellarization process, get this here, is you go through cycles of taking these cells off and you rinse the cells off, you lice all the cells so you destroy them, um, you have to destroy the cell membrane on them, you remove the proteins, you take all the DNA out, and you do this different times. When we first started, you had to do this 40 different times, and we've narrowed it down now through research to only doing it three times, which is much better, because that's one cycle a day. So it used to take over a month just to decellarize this, which is a long process and required a lot of materials. And once the trachea is decellularized, you can kind of see that area here, you wash it, and then we send it to an area, to a place that can completely sterilize it. They use high pressure CO2, and it, it permeates throughout the entire trachea or whatever organ it is that you have, and it completely sterilizes it. So then we bring it back, and this is what that bioreactor I mentioned was from before for the trachea, where it has that ro the rotator area in the, in the inside. The trachea is, oops, trachea is there. I gotta remember not to touch this. The trachea is here, and it rotates through the liquid air interface. And so this is just uh, uh, fixing the, the tracheas to the bioreactors. We have four separate bioreactors here. And this was in preparing for a study. And then we take that cell, we take the trachea in the bioreactor, and we add the cells to it. So we want it to po populate the inner lining, because that's the most important part of the trachea, so we do that first. We then put it in our into an incubator with our bioreactors, and you can see there's four separate bioreactors here, pumps, and some of our solutions, and those pumps continually replace that solution so they're getting fresh um, act, bioactive factors throughout their, their entire cycle as that's rotating in an incubator uh, through an air-liquid interface. What causes those cells to adhere to your, to your scaffold? Um, well, we, we inject them directly onto the scaffold itself, but cells, they, they can't live without adhering. Most least epithelial cells, they have to adhere to something. And so their first preference is to find a place to anchor themselves, and then they branch out to touch other cells next to them. Right from there. Uh, and then we see the, uh, the outside part of it. And then from there, um, one of the early concerns that people had when you decellularize these is you lost the structure of the trachea. So the cartilage itself became very flimsy. And so anytime uh, someone would breathe, the whole cartilage would collapse. And so we try to get around that by putting a stent in through that. And actually, by decellularizing it only three times, that doesn't happen anyway, but we, it was part of the protocol. So we put a stent around the outside because we didn't want anything to interrupt, uh, disrupt the cells on the inside. And then you implant it uh, as a whole part of the trachea. And so that's the process of the decellularization. The other part of it is geared more towards our larynx cancer patients and is geared more towards the 3D printing. And so, like I had mentioned before, there's a little video, is here we're looking at the voice box, and most cancers are on only one side of the voice box. And so like, we have to take out the whole voice box because we can't reconstruct that. But we, when they come to see us, we identify the cancer, and then they go through their normal preoperative routine. So we'll get a CT scan, 
The patient will go in and get a CT scan. That's usually a few days after they see us. Um, <clears throat> and that scan will show us where the tumor involvement is. So we have an idea of where, what all needs to be resected with the surgery. And we can then take the, make a th re 3D reconstructed image, remove the affected area, and we're left with basically the good part of it. So we can recreate that by making a mirror image of this or adding to that in case there's a bigger defect. Then we can print that mirror image with a variety of different, whatever you want your scaffold material to be. Um, you, there are different types of printers. Some printers actually print the cells within the scaffold, or some of these are just for uh, print and inert material. And then you can put another layer on the outside that allows the cells to, to adhere to that, that, that construct. So it can actually print cells? It can actually print cells, yep. So there are it's certain... One, one option. Exactly. You either print cells within the scaffold or you can print the scaffold and attach something to the scaffold that the cells can live in. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting, while this process is happening, we've taken fat from the patient, which takes 10 minutes, and we separate, these are the stem cells, these are adipose-derived stem cells, and so we multiply those so that we, they increase in number, and then we cause them to differentiate in the type of tissue we want. Put them on that graft, put that whole entire graft into the bioreactor, which takes about a, a week or two weeks. Yeah, on average, it takes us two to three weeks to get the patient to the operating room to remove the cancer anyway. So by the time we come in, remove the cancer, our re tissue regenerated implant is ready, and we can then implant in at the time. Whereas opposed, this used to have to be, would have been a total laryngectomy and they, wouldn't have, they would have had all those problems. Now we have a construct here that allows the normal functioning vocal fold to come over and touch something. You don't have to have both vocal folds work. You just need one that works and allows it to touch somewhere else. Will that sooner or later work, or, or is it just? Well, right now, right now it's just going to be a static structure. But it will, um, over time, from what we've seen in other studies, the more you use that and the more you cause yeah, vibration, right, yeah, right. you'll actually get a new, it's called a neocord that forms it. And not a true vocal fold, but something that actually vibrates and becomes a vocal fold. But it won't move in and out. But there are lots, and probably one of the most common surgeries I do are for people that have a paralyzed vocal fold from you know, some surgery that damages the nerve. And their vocal fold structurally is fine, it just doesn't have that motion. So they sound like this because they can't get their words closed. And so all I have to do is go in and push the vocal fold over and they sound 99% of what they used to. They don't have the pitch range as much, but you wouldn't know by just talking like a presentation like this. What I'm getting at is like the more the practice, it, learn, will it, learn? it won't. It won't learn to this motion. It will learn the vibratory components. It will over time. So those those cells that are growing on there will actually turn into a new vocal fold kind of. So there was another study I didn't show you in this presentation where they did a hemi laryngectomy, which is what the surgery is, took out half the voice box, and they just put a decellularized matrix, which is. Um, basically skin that doesn't have any cells on it. And they just put that in there. And over time, just that structure ended up forming a new vocal fold. At least, a, you know, not a true one, but a, something similar that actually vibrated. So as long as that's where, that's where the importance of the form comes in. So you can, what we're doing is we're just starting the process and the body's doing the rest of the work by it being in the right location at the right time with the right cells. Yeah. Yeah, so your body really serves as the bioreactor over time. We're just getting the head start. Yeah. That's it. That's for, for me. I'm happy to ask, answer questions, or I know it's kind of a brief overview. But yeah, so questions or anything? So how many years do you think it would be before that this one actually would be available? The which component of it, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> All of it, yeah. If, 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 if you take a person who mm -hmm. For the video that I just showed, I'm um, thinking a year and a half. Is where our oh, timeline yeah. is, yeah, our timeline is for about that. And it, it's, it's, it looks fancy, but it's, it's really very mm -hmm. primitive when you think about it. It's just a 3D printed structure that has the correct form, and then it has a cellular graft on it that allows the cells to be in the right location. The hard part 
is getting the blood supply to that area so those cells don't die in the meantime. And so we have different ways of reconstructing the throat when we do that to bring fresh tissue in there that has a good blood supply to it. So it's really where we are now is uh, we are testing those different substrates that we put on the 3D scaffold. Uh, we, have, we have the ability already to print uh, larynx there. You can see it up in the upper corner there. So we have, that's an entire larynx that is 3D printed from our lab. So we have the ability to print the entire thing or half a thing, whatever, whatever structure you want it to be in, and then modify it if it's not exactly what you want it to be. So that's there. So it's really just finding the optimal um, timing of the bioreactor process, the op proper cells, those types of things. And so we're not too far away. The, sorry, one last thing, sorry. The, the regenerated trachea, that's already been, been done. That's probably been done 10 times with variable success. Some have worked beautifully, some haven't worked at all. And that's the unfortunate nature of, of new science is you don't always get very consistent results. So we're trying to optimize that. There was, there was a presentation in here and the, and the surgeon was talking about taking cells and causing them to grow a new valve for a heart. Mm -hmm. You can inject that into the heart. Okay, I can see how you can you can get your frame of the larynx, and I can see cells going around it, invading it, and all of that. But the vocal cords. I, I mean, do you actually make a frame for that, or you do? You make you make a frame to allow for if you if you look at it. You know, the best way to it's got to be it. soft. It well, it it doesn't have to be because you're, you're, it has to be, it can't be like this hard, but as long as it's somewhat soft, all you're trying to do is, is provide a surface for the other vocal fold to touch. So, so that's the important if, part. If you got to the point where you're trying to get them both to move, then Yes, then well, different... right, exactly. If you had to recreate both of them, then at least one of them would have to be soft. The other, you know, one could be rigid too, but you'd have to get that movement, and that's where those pacers or different things would come in, or, um, you'd have to have one firm and, and one stuff that comes on with it. Yeah. Sorry, what was your question? No, you're fine. I was just going to ask, so when you talk about the scaffold, scaffolding, uh -huh. it, is that the piece you actually put in? You actually, so you grow something in that or within it or on it and then you put that with the cell into the body? Correct, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it depends on right now, uh, growing or printing cells within the structure is called bioprinting and that's very, very early on. So um, the higher yield at this point until we get that better uh, known is to do the scaffold and then figure out a way to get the cells to either grow on the scaffold or put something around that shape that you know the cells will grow on. Yeah. Yeah. That scarring in women that you were saying that you, you, you have, they have no idea what causes it? Correct. That would be an internal cause. Would that be an internal cause? Well, there are the different theories. So one of the theories is that it's from um, coughing. So some, and women have smaller tracheas and the, um, the junction between what's called the cricoid cartilage, which is a complete ring, and the trachea, um, what will happen a lot of times in women when they cough is the, the, that ring of the voice box doesn't move, the trachea pushes up into that. <clears throat> and so that doesn't, the men tend to have more rigid structures and so you don't see that movement. And so they're thinking, well, it may be from that. Um, the other things we think it may be from are because they're, the disease tends to worsen around childbirth and menopause. And so maybe is there an upregulation of different hormonal cells that are there that your body sees as an abnormal response and goes and tends to attack those cells. And so that's what we're looking at with the DNA analysis is, are there proteins there you don't find anywhere else? And so the way we structured that, that study is we biopsied the scarred site, biopsied the same person further down in the trachea, and then for patients that were going to the operating room for another reason, they gave me permission to biopsy where the scar would have been in them. So now we have a comparison to self and a comparison to the same area in someone that doesn't have the disease. And so we can then look at the different DNA and different proteins in all three sites and say, well, in the scarred people, they only have these certain proteins. And so then those are what you focus on to, for a bigger study after that. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, pleasure. So anything with full paralysis resulting from trauma such as whiplash? Uh, it can. So those tend to be more stretch injuries like whiplash where if your neck's getting thrown back like this, if that nerve is at all stretched, 
Um, I always call that nerve a diva. It, you know, it's, it acts like a diva, where, which is they, they only do what they want to do when they want to do it, and if you force them to do anything else, they stop working. I'm not going to do it anymore. And so we see that a lot with our neck surgeries. Sometimes we'll just literally just touch that nerve and push it out of the way really gently, and it stops working. And it can stop working for a year. Some, some they never come back, even if you, know, you have them cut them. But the vast majority of people, within about three months, it starts working again. So that tends to be most whiplash injuries. They throw their head back, it stretches that nerve, stops working temporarily, and then at some point it comes back on its own. If it's not back in a year, that's when we go in and permanently push it over. Yeah. Yeah, but we. Diagnose with vocal fold paralysis where one side, only one side vibrates. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see, and her voice, not to use you as an example, but your voice sounds pretty good. Yeah, and so you don't have to have complete function of both low folds. You just have to have the ability to get them close together. And so what we see, um, if your nerve was never completely transected or completely cut, then what happens is you get re of that nerve, but it may not be down the right pathways. So that provides for bulk. The muscle doesn't atrophy, so it bulks. And when it first gets paralyzed, your vocal cord is out here. And over time, because that muscle bulks up, it actually gets pushed to the midline for some people. And so some people, you can't hear that they have a paralysis at all because that bulk falls in a pretty good position. Um, but they do tend to, because it's not perfect, they tend to fatigue. So the more they talk over the course of a day, their voice gets worse. They can't yell. It's harder for them to shout across the room. Given a 20-minute talk like I just did, you know, by now their voice would be pretty, pretty shot. So they can accommodate pretty well for short periods of time, but over a long term, they will tend to fatigue. I don't know if that happens to you or not, but yeah, pretty typical, unfortunately, yeah. So, but yeah, if it hasn't come back in a year or so, it's probably not going to come back. Yeah. Just with a normal voice, you know how when you're younger and you sing a lot, mm -hmm. and you use your vocal cords and that, and then through life, you don't do what you used to do, and then you try to do it. Yes. You know, it... it I'm hearing what you're saying about this lady, and I'm thinking about it's just you got to practice. I've always learned that you just have to practice and use it. Mm -hmm. Does that play into effect with this? It it does a little bit. If if the neuromuscular uh, complex is intact and otherwise normal, then practicing and doing all those things is will a huge improve it. will improve it. If that's not intact, then you can practice all the practice in the world you want, and it's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah, because it's not getting any signal from the brain to move. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like trying to, you know, practice with an amputated leg, trying to practice walking. It doesn't matter how much you practice. If your leg's not there, you can't walk. Yeah. yeah. Phantom pain, though, is there. It's very real. Yes, exactly right. It's very real. Yeah. And interestingly enough, we actually get that a lot with people that have, you know, you hear a lot of people that have chronic coughs or they cough a lot or they have something that's just constantly stuck in their throat. That's actually a phantom pain or it depends on pain that's in your throat because your voice box, because it's so important when you swallow, it's actually number one priority is preventing your food from going into your lungs. And so when it's chronically irritated from reflux, post nasal drainage, you know, you had laryngitis or bronchitis, whatever it is that's irritating that, it gets hypersensitive. And so it actually sends signals to your brain for normal everyday things. You, you, you breathe in cold air, you swallow your saliva, um, any normal everyday thing that doesn't bother the rest of us, when your voice box is overly sensitive, you kind of get phantom pain, so your brain thinks there's something stuck in my throat and I've got to clear it out. So we see lots of people that come in for, I have horrible post or drainage, and we look and there's nothing there. It's because their brain is thinking they have something there when it's actually just their voice box being too sensitive. And that could cause, some, cause something to go into your lungs? No, it actually helped, it, it prevents that, so it's overactive. Oh, it yes, that. it overactive. Okay, so it's, it's telling your brain, that things are going to your lungs when they're really not. Oh, I am. Okay, yeah. I, I misunderstood. Yeah, no, I didn't clearly say that very well. Yeah. Even though it's not there, it coughs it out. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So people are trying like, crazy oh, to cough really, really, really hard. Right. Really, really hard, yeah. Uh, when you were describing that, my sister in law, she has problems with aspiration, mm -hmm. and you caught my attention on that, and I was sure. thinking too much and trying to listen at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. So, yeah. Um, it, the larynx is for something that's taken for granted and very ugly, which is why I always tell people eyes on the inside. It's kind of a weird looking organ. Um, it's a really a fascinating thing. It, it governs so much of your life that you, that you take for granted until so all of a sudden something happens and then it's wow, I didn't realize it had so much to do with everything. So. That, I guess, what's called life's learning experience. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. You don't know what you got until it's gone, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. The concept of 3D printing felt was fascinating. Can you describe in general 
how that works? Is it using cells as like the ink? Or? Yeah, so 3D printers, they're, because it's pretty new, there's a huge variety of, of how they work. So some of them work by um, just putting, printing a material and then having it cured from the outside. So you print a material and then you use UV lights and that can harden it pretty quickly. Uh, some of them will, like we have actually upstairs in one of the labs here that have a, uh, has a bioprinter. And it just has basically what look like syringes, very fine, precise syringes. And you can fill the syringes up with whatever you want in it. And the, the, the machine is designed to let a, a controlled amount that you can control out in whatever pattern you tell it to do. And so if you do, say, hyaluronic acid for vocal folds that have cells and bioactive factors, you can create that, put it in that syringe, and then it prints that structure. So the problem with those isn't... But it's a, you have a computer model of it first. Exactly, a computer model or a computer drawing. Yeah, so something you can completely draw on the computer too if you wanted to. It doesn't have to be from a CT scan or something, but it just does whatever you tell it to. And you can define what, how the pore sizes are, how small space between the layers you want. So it may make the structure, whatever you tell it to be, but there's a lot of parameters that go into how it's made. But it will, the hard part with that is it's not getting it printed, it's getting the cells to survive because they need nutrients really quickly and they need blood really quickly. And so it's one thing to print them, and then, then they die in a couple hours because they don't have anything to support them. Well, that's the problem they've been running into with the 3D printers, is, is that. Is yeah. it possible to print them so that they're identical to location, or is that a process that takes place afterwards? No, you can print them, you can use, you can take the patient cells and put them right in the printer. Yeah, yeah, right away. Yeah. So I, I imagine probably not too far away, ORs will just have a 3D bioprinter in there and you harvest the cells and at the time of the surgery. And you just put them right in there and it creates it and you put it right back in. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty fascinating. Does it do any good to put hyaluronic acid directly into a patient? It does. For people with paralysis, that's what, actually what we do is we use Restylane or other hyaluronic acid based uh, materials and we inject it either with really next to the vocal fold and it pushes the vocal fold over to a better position. The problem with hyaluronic acid is by itself, it only has a half-life of five days. <clears throat> Meaning if you put in 10 milliliters of it, five milliliters of it's gonna be gone in five days. So it doesn't last very long. So you have to try to figure out a way to modify that um, or to use it as an initial carrying agent to carry cells that will then reproduce more hyaluronic acid in a sustained fashion. And so those are what we try to do is there's um, adipose drive stem cells will do that. Something called hepatocyte growth factor, which is your body has different growth factors that help cells to differentiate. If you put stem cells in with fibroblast growth factor and hepatocyte growth factor, those growth factors help those stem cells to regenerate very quickly and then to create hyaluronic acid. So that you, we know that if we put stem cells in with these growth factors, they're actually gonna make hyaluronic acid. And so you put it in in the substrate of hyaluronic acid that's gonna be there for five days, and then you're gonna have a, a, a lag time where those cells are starting to create more. And so hopefully, the stuff that you injected starts uh, waning as the other stuff starts coming up. But again, these are years off, so unfortunately, yes. <laughs> but very, I mean, the proof of concept is there. We know that we can do this, add this and this, and it gets add A and to B and to get C. We know we can reliably and predictably do that. It's how do you sustain that in, in a clinical setting. Well, that's, that's where we are for those. Yeah. Yes? So, um, someone who maybe has had surgery years ago mm -hmm. and actually had their voice box removed, is there any hope for them? Or does it have to be? From not right now, not from a regenerative tissue, but from the immunosuppressed transplantation. That's who we're actually focusing on first with the transplantation program. Or laryngectomy patients who are considered cured from their cancer, so they're five years out. Then we can go back in and transplant them and safely put them back on immunosuppression. Yeah. So there's um, about 50,000, believe it or not, laryngectomies done a year. So that tells you how many patients are out there that would be candidates for this. And as of now, there isn't any place where they can come to reliably to, to get, get this fixed for them. What's the major cause of the cancer? 
Uh, um, smoking. Yeah. Right. yeah, by 90%, 95% of all larynx cancers are from smoking. Yeah. Well, we are seeing a shift from smoking as less people smoke. It's interesting how life works, is we're seeing more and more viral induced cancers. So HPV induced cancers, just like you see in the base of tongue or in the pharynx, we're starting to see those in the voice box too. So as the incidence from smoking decreases, the virus is going back up. So in all, there hasn't been a net difference, amazingly, which is really frustrating. <laughs> you, know, you, mean, you mean when the, it's caused from cancer, the other one is love, and vice versa? Well, you no, know, it's more like it's if... It's not proportional or anything? Like no, no. Mm -mm. Not, that, not that we've seen. It's, it's just kind of a trend that we're, we're starting to see. But you know, we're starting to see more and more cancers from the virus than we are from smokers. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, there's, there's some debate. So there's never been any distinct proof that reflux causes cancers. I, well, in the larynx. In the esophagus, we know it does. Um, in the larynx, we don't know that it causes. I do know that it is another irritant. So if you smoke and have reflux, you're more likely to get a cancer because cancers are traditionally caused by something that's irritating the cells, making them to turn over quickly. So they're being destroyed by smoke or by reflux or whatever it is. The faster those cells have to turn over, the higher there's a chance for an error in, in, in the DNA. And that error is what then turns into a cancer over time. So whatever is irritating your voice box, the more and more that's irritated, the higher your chance of cancer is. Yeah, which the viruses go in and do the same thing. They go in, they change the DNA structure of the cell, and it turns into a cancer. Yeah. The good news, though, with the viral cancers is they tend to have a better outcome than cancers from smoking does. So, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. Oh, you're very welcome. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Happy to answer.